Witt is the Author Guild Foundation Words, Ideas, and Speakers Thinkers Series, where we explore interesting issues and ideas. And today we are talking with Sam Sifton about food and writing and cooking and other things that sustain us. My name is Lynn Bolger, and I am the Executive Director of the Authors Guild Foundation, which is the charitable arm of the Authors Guild. For those of you joining us for Sam and have never come to one of these before, um, some fun facts about us and why we do what we do and why it's so important. So the Guild is America's collective voice for writers, writers of all kinds um, and genres from journalists to biographers, novelists, poets, historians, works. And as we know, writing is a very solitary act and individuals acting alone really can't move the dime on issues of fair treatment. But since the early 1900s, the Guild has acted as America's author's megaphone, amplifying the demand for fair contracts and ensuring authors' copyrighted works are not infringed upon, and that freedom of speech is protected and piracy challenged. And we want to ensure this rich and diverse country has a rich and diverse literary culture. One of the fun parts of my job is to promote an understanding of the value of writers. That's where this series comes in. And we are promoting an understanding of the value of writers today with Sam Sifton. I have known Sam for about four years now, I guess, or should I say he has known me for about four years? <laughs> I have known him a lot longer. And you are all here because you know Sam too. So I'm going to try to sneak in some anecdotes and stories that are less well known. And here's one. So we have a mutual friend um, who was having dinner in Rhode Island with a couple of reporters from the Times. And one of them said, two things have saved the New York Times over the past five years. One of them is Sam Sifton. The other was Donald Trump. So um, <laughs> <laughs> I love that story, and we'll talk about why he said that. Um, but Sam, let's start at the beginning, um, not the early career stuff, the teaching high school or early journalism gigs. Let's start with the food stuff. Um, you were the New York Times food critic, restaurant reviewer, a position that wields an enormous amount of power and responsibility. What is a normal week like? Oh, as the restaurant critic, it's, you know, it's, it's really difficult to complain about that job, but I'll, I'll, I'll try. Um, it, 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 it's, it's like a death by massage, right? You're, you're going out to dinner six nights a week. You could go seven nights a week, but I need that one night where I'm just not, right, where I just wasn't going to be at a table and, and getting served. You're, you're, um, you're always a different person because we eat anonymously or we eat under assumed names. Um, it's really easy to forget who you are if you've left a credit card at the bar and they say, what's the credit card name, please? Uh, I can't quite remember, can't remember who, I, I, I tried to remember, but you can't always do it. So it's a little nervous. It, basically it's like being Jason Bourne with no danger whatsoever. You're constantly on the move and, and, and wondering like, have I been made? Can I get through? How am I going to take my notes? Without did you did you do the the whole uh, costume the, thing? The, yeah, the the costume thing, which worked so well for my predecessor Ruth Reichel, didn't work so so well for me, uh, in part because you know the, even with access to Broadway costumers, the 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 wig situation is not very strong, and it's very easy to see that it's a fake hair piece um, as a bald man. Um, when the when the waiters and captains are literally standing above you looking down on your head. So costumes didn't really work for me, but misdirection did. And maybe that's a form of costuming, right? I, I understand that I have or had as the critic, maybe still have a kind of image as this waspy guy who always wears button downs and a blue blazer. And if you change that, 
you've introduced some mystery, like maybe that isn't the guy, maybe that's a guy who just looks like him. So if I wore, say, a black dress shirt, maybe a little mm -hmm. chain, I'm clearly not Samson. It's, it's a guy who looks like Samson. There's so many bald white guys in New York City that you could, you could just change up one aspect of your clothing and then you're maybe not that guy. So the whole gig was the complete opposite of everything that I've been trained to do as a journalist, right? I'm, I'm pretending to be someone else. I'm not announcing uh -huh. myself as a journalist. I'm there trying to be every man. And it's disconcerting and strange. And oh my goodness, it is relentless. You are eating so much food. And so physical activity becomes, it's like a flak jacket for a conflict reporter. You know, I had, to, I don't want to show up feeling logy. I don't know if that's how you pronounce that word, L-O-G-Y, but you don't want to show up feeling kind of weird or un I, I wanted to be hungry and psyched to be in the uh -huh. restaurant every time and in order to do that you gotta you gotta expend a lot of um calories and i couldn't just expend calories through the kind of adrenaline and fear of deadline that helps but it's it's not enough so my to answer your question in a short way after this long-winded way it was a lot of beating a lot of misdirection a lot of scheduling, a lot of working out, and mm -hmm. a ton of really good eating and some terrible eating too. Uh -oh. um, how did you build on the reputation of what came before you and, and maybe talk a little bit about the, that position um, and the, the sort of hallowed ground of a, the star system and you know, really how Ruth came in and blew it up. Well, okay, so so let's look at the, let's look at the, you know, at the, at a kind of 30,000 foot view of the history of restaurant criticism at the Times, which really began, everyone wants to say it began with Craig Claiborne. It didn't, it began with his predecessor, Jane Nickerson, who is a kind of criminally undervalued, um, person in the history of food journalism in America and a really, really, I would argue, more important figure than, than Claiborne. Um, she was his, his predecessor and she started the kind of, everyone says Craig started the modern restaurant review. Jane Nickerson started it. Um, she, she left the paper um, to, to move to Lakeland, Florida, where the Times had a satellite paper where she was eventually the food editor. Um, and Craig became, and like white dudes everywhere, took all the credit and became the guy. And he started the star system and he was, uh -huh. you know, Craig was an amazing figure. Not perhaps the best writer in the world, but, um, but an amazing figure with a, um, um, an immense appetite, not just for food but for, mm -hmm. for understanding the food ways of the United States. I came in much, 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 much later following Frank Pruny, who was a, just a tremendous restaurant critic um, and before Pete Wells. So Pete Wells is the critic now, there was me, there was Bruni, before Bruni, Biff Crimes, and it goes back. Let's talk about Ruth, because Ruth Reichel is the transformative figure in restaurant criticism at the New York Times. She's the one who arrives from California. She worked in alternative press. She worked at the LA Times. She comes to New York, and all of a sudden she starts, she's, she's giving three stars to a soba noodle place in, in, in Soho. And when I say that people were clutching their pearls or having heart attacks at that, that's pretty close to the truth. Brian Miller, who had been the restaurant critic of the New York Times and was still at the New York Times when Ruth arrived, was so incensed that he wrote memos to the leadership of the paper, to people on the masthead. I'm now on the masthead. I get those things. I get it when people freak out. But it was those memos leaked to page six on, in the New York Post where he was saying she is destroying the star system. And that 
statement, destroying the star system, allows us to look back and say that, okay, in the world of Brian Miller, in the world of Mimi Sheraton, in the world of Craig Claiborne, there were really only like 500 restaurants in New York that were worth reviewing because why? They had white tablecloths, they had yeah. European service standards. I, I'm, I'm not sure, although that's exactly why. In reality, there are, there are 16,000 restaurants in, in New York City. And Ruth was the first person to say, let's open up the possibility that a, a soba spot can be a three-star restaurant. Um, I, you know, there were moments before that when, I mean, Clay, you know, uh, Claiborne did give some pretty high ratings to some Chinese restaurants in, in, in New York prior to the um, arrival of Ruth. But Ruth completely transformed the language, the point of view, the, the she paved the way for, for the rest of us. So. And I love how all of a sudden we're looking at other people's cultures and we're emulating how these restaurants are cooking and the ingredients that get into the Hannaford shops here at, you know, it, it feels like people are like, oh, that's really cuisine. If it's being reviewed in. Well, I, I, I'll push back on that a little bit. I mean, there's sort of two, two strands in what you're saying. One is about the availability of mm -hmm. ingredients. And the other is about the kind of popularization of the cuisine. Nickerson, Claiborne actually did a pretty good job of acknowledging that the tapestry of American cuisine was much more intricate and beautiful mm -hmm. than um, the joy of cooking would allow, right? So we see the arrival of, of recipes for Sichuan food or Cantonese food or Indian food in the pages of the New York Times way earlier than people would think. Like, the New York Times has this reputation uh -huh. as the old gray lady, but in reality, when you go back and say, did the New York Times cover like punk rock at CBGB's? And like, yeah, yeah, it did. There was, you know, there's John Rockwell at CBGB's on, you know, re reviewing a punk rock show in 1977. I didn't know the New York Times did that. I didn't realize that Jane Nickerson was writing about Cantonese food in, you know, 1956 in, in the New York Times. But you couldn't get those ingredients outside of the metropolitan area. And that's the thing that has made our the explosion of New York Times cooking, the explosion of appreciation for the world's cuisines among the, the readership of the Times and the expanded readership of the Times possible. The fact that you can get lemongrass at Hannaford. Yeah. When I was yeah, a kid, yeah. you, couldn't, you couldn't do that. That did, just no. didn't exist. And now you can. And yeah. if you can't at Hannaford's, you can, I can't remember the name of the company, Amazon, I think it's called, does provide- I haven't heard of it. Haven't, no. I'm sorry, no. I, I, I think it's Amazon. Anyway, there is a, a service out there that sends you this stuff- like Through the before mail, you, interesting. At, like two seconds after you think of it. Wow. Check it out, it's on the internet. So, okay, I will. Um, when you left that position, we're gonna, we're gonna transition over, but, um, and people were talking about who would replace you. Um, I wanna talk about your writing voice, but um, Anthony Bourdain did it for me. He suggested that the next critic should be like Sifton, entertaining, <laughs> sharp, unafraid, and occasionally sentimental. A food critic should like food and chefs should have a soft spot. For tradition and um like amazing right so were you always a cook how did this happen um i you know frank it does frank rooney can he write a cookbook it, are you an anomaly in the food no frank frank, frank frank wrote a cookbook he wrote a cookbook with jennifer steinhauer all about um making meatloaf frank's a great I, cook um i I have, um, food's been a part of my, well, I mean, like all of you, I eat 
at least three times a day every day. Um, I well, I guess at Condé Nast they don't eat three times a day; they only eat once a day. But um, at the Times we eat three times a day. Maybe at the Artists Guild, uh, it's it's the same thing. Food's always been an interest of of mine. Uh, I'm a child in New York City. I grew up in Brooklyn, so food is like central to our understanding of of the world. And um, a, a diversity of food is 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 a big part of growing up in, in in New York. So it was always there for me. At my first newspaper, the New York Press, um, I wrote about food. I also wrote about media and music and culture and all sorts of stuff. But what I realized about food early on was that it provides an inroad to talk with anyone at any time. Um, you can start with food and, and move on. I was, um, I was, I had an amazing experience um, during uh, the, the run up to the 2020 elections when the Times was bringing people, uh, candidates into the newsroom to, to talk to them about their positions on various issues and, and the like. And I got a call from Patrick Healy, the, the, um, the politics editor. And he said, are you in the building? I wasn't. I was about 10 blocks north finishing. I was actually at Random House finishing a meeting to do with a, a cookbook. And he said, you got to get back here. Kamala Harris is here and she wants to talk to you. OK. <sighs> So I rush back to the newsroom and end up in conversation with the then presidential candidate and, and now vice president of the United States, Kamala Harris, about nothing to do with policy and everything to do with the importance of family dinner and what recipes she cooks and how she cooks and how she uses New York Times cooking and what her relationship is to the newsletter that I write. And it was just, it was amazing. Um, um, I mean, totally gratifying as a, as a writer to have that kind of interaction, but also sort of fun. And, and I was able to end that conversation by saying, you know, Senator Harris, are you pledging a chicken in every American's pot? <laughs> <laughs> and she laughed and went on. So I think that food is just the, one of the greatest ways to, as a journalist, to, to begin and, and continue a conversation that leads to really interesting material. So September 2014, the cooking app launches. It featured 16,000 recipes available at no charge. Yep. Three years later, there's a wall that's $5 a month. And now, the New York Times cooking has a newsletter that comes out Sunday, Wednesday, Friday. The app has hundreds of thousands of subscribers. Last I checked, the Instagram feed had 3.2 million followers. There's a YouTube channel, videos. Now, the Times always had a food section, but this is something so explosively different, something that was at the right Place at the right time, met a need we did not know we had. And I'm wondering, like, how did it come about? How, how were you the, the, the person in the right place at the right time? How much did you craft the business end of it? Oh, I listen, the business end of it, not me. I can barely, I, I, I have like $3 in my pocket and, and I'm going to take a few cans over. Like, I'm not a business guy. But I, but I am an entrepreneur and, a, and an evangelist for, for the work that we do. Um, I think if, if there were like a Times uh, comms person here that like wrap me on the knuckles and not allow me to offer numbers. And so I won't offer numbers, but I will say that the, cause we just had an earnings call and I can't remember where our numbers are at publicly, but I do know that the New York Times cooking now has more subscribers than the Boston Globe and the Los Angeles Times have to their newspapers combined. So it's big. We have a lot of paying subscribers to New York Times Cooking who aren't subscribers to the New York Times, which suggests that there are audiences 
uh, four times material that are broader than, than, than for the paper. I spent a few minutes at the beginning of this talk railing uh, or wailing on, depending on what part of the country you're from, on, on Craig Claiborne. Now I want to pay him a compliment. He had the foresight to understand that the combination of the New York Times as a brand and the recipes that the Times publishes could combine yeah. to be a, 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 a really big force in the marketplace. And so the New York Times cookbook, which he put together out of New York Times recipes, largely created by Jane Nickerson and others and published um, in uh, the, the late 1960s, that became a national bestseller at a time when the Times was not a national newspaper, it was not a regional newspaper, but was a metropolitan newspaper. And it's amazing to me, here's a really interesting fact, it's amazing to me that the, that the copyright for the New York Times cookbook belonged to Craig Claiborne, not to the New York Times. Um, I think that that's that if if you want if you want proof of you know how uh, history is going to come and get you um, the the kind of the homophobia that goes into a news organization saying like ah this guy making this book of go ahead make the recipes you cute little man and then he does. And it becomes a national bestseller, and the Times doesn't get a dime. I, 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 from the moment I got to the the food section, I had that in my mind that uh, we could capture that for a digital audience. And so, capturing it for a digital audience, and not for my benefit, I don't make a dime off New York Times cooking except for my salary. Um, I thought it could work. And so I was a big evangelist for it. I, I'm not the business guy. I'm not the, I'm not the engineer. I'm not the designer. Um, I'm not the photographer. I'm, I'm just the, the guy in the top hat dancing as fast as I can saying this work is incredible. And this user experience is incredible. And if you come and join us, you will see that we have a value and that value um, is is worth your five dollars a month i i just i i know you're you're being very humble i i just would like to say that your voice is it it in endears you you're sort of um your voice endears you to so many writers and um for instance my I, I have many friends, but this particular friend is such an amazing cook. And, um, you know, we talk about what are you having for dinner? What are you making for the holidays? Uh, you know, these big food events. And um, I said, hey, Jerry, you know, what are you, what are you cooking for Thanksgiving? And she says, whatever Sam Sifton tells me to. <laughs> um, and I think many people feel that way. Like, what am I cooking? And then here comes your newsletter and what to cook this weekend. But um, for it's those of really, you who don't know what a Sam Sifton quintessential paragraph is, this is it. So we're talking about Thanksgiving. So sketch out your plans, make invitations, book your flights, order your turkey from that place that raises the birds on poems, yoga, and organic food. Line up some wine. But remember, as you do that, Thanksgiving will land differently this year for each of your guests, for your host, for your parents, for your children and your friends. Listen to each, to what they say, and importantly, what they do not. Practice radical empathy and everything will be all right. And Sam, I got to say, like, you manage in that paragraph, as you do in every newsletter, to be utterly yourself but also to make us feel like it's okay how it ends. We're gonna laugh. You're gonna take us along this ride. And I think you, your, your top, your black hat and tap dance really make the product for so many of us 
Um, so you can never leave and we're going to move on from that. <laughs> um, let's cover your cookbooks. No recipe recipes. Thanksgiving. We'll talk about that in depth and see you on Sunday. Um, amazing pieces of work. Uh, your voice is throughout them. Talk about no recipe recipes, which I think is like, who would buy such a thing? It's genius. It's an absolute genius piece of writing and cookbooking. Well, thank you. Thank you, Lynn. It, it, it's a project that arose out of, listen, I write that newsletter four times a week. I've written it four times a week since, what did you say? 2014? That's how long I've been doing that? That is insane to me. That's like, you know, at, at newspapers, we're not about the byline counts, but you look at sports writers, they have a lot of bylines. I'm like a sports writer at this point. I have a ton of bylines. Like I, I, I'm knocking down four or five bylines a week and all of it in service of getting people to cook. And at a certain point, I think I got with the newsletter to, to a state of mind where I thought like, really, am I really going to have like a little homily at the top? And then I'm going to give you like 10 recipes. And then here are some movies you should watch. And I'm out. Like, it gets to be too formulaic for me. It's boring for me. So if it's boring for me, it's going to be boring for you. So I started to think about how when I report on recipes, when I report with chefs, with home cooks, with anyone who cooks better than me, I, I get them to explain, I never ask for a recipe because let me tell you, the worst recipe writers on earth are chefs. And the second worst recipe writers on earth are like moms and grandmoms. Cause ev first of all, everybody's lying. They're gonna leave something out or they don't know how to explain it, or they're only able to tell their sous chefs how to, how to do it. So I would much prefer to watch and listen, watch and listen, or have someone tell me. It's much better for me to ask the chef, how do you make it? Then will you give me a recipe? And the language that the conversational language of a chef explaining how to make something to me allows me to make that food. I thought, cheapers. I could do that with our readers. I'm a pretty good writer. I should be able to talk someone through this in such a way that they can get a good result. So I started putting them in the newsletter. And after I don't know, three or four years, I was like, boy, I wish I had kept those. I wish I had kept, a, like, kept them in a file. And this is the beauty of the New York Times. My editor, Mark Josephson, lesson said oh i've been keeping them for i've i have a word file i take those paragraphs and put them into a word file so i had this thing and and i was like let's take a look and we read through it and i thought we can make something of this and and we approached 10 speed press and they were interested and we were able to pull it together and i had, I had to kind of write it through a little bit well write it through a lot but holy cannoli all of a sudden we've got this thing where it's just me talking to the reader about how to make something and allowing all kinds of stuff to happen. If you don't have X, use Y. If you don't have yeah. Y, use Z. If you don't have any of those things, don't use any of those things. And basically, if you have some confidence, it's gonna be great. If you have no confidence, it's gonna be pretty good. And the next time it'll be great. Because every time you make a no recipe recipe, that recipe becomes yours, not mine, yours. It, it, is, it is such a fun read, but let's talk about um, turkey, Thanksgiving, um, and your rule of no appetizers, no nibblies before. You have yeah, a- it's, it's funny, I feel like, I feel like when it comes to Thanksgiving, I'm, I'm turning into, I'm a strict constructionist, like, I, I, I'm like, I'm John Roberts or something. Like, I'm not going to like, so yes, for me, no appetizers. I did not spend eight hours preparing this turkey and these side dishes and, and all this amazing food 
for you to like gorge on nuts and cheese and then refuse seconds. Like, sorry, come hungry. I'm going to give you a trencherman's plate of food. You're going to have a great time. So I believe very firmly, like no oysters with one exception, which is oysters. Because oysters don't really take up any room. It's like like a sip of water. So oysters, then, um, then the meal. And with the meal, again, strict constructionist, I do believe there must be turkey. You can have, we have ham. It's great to have ham, have ham at Easter, have ham at Christmas, have ham whenever you want. But like, really, this one time a year, we can have a roast turkey. People say, oh, I don't like turkey. Oh, really? What's the number one deli sandwich meat in the United States? Oh, it's turkey. We like turkey. We're scared of cooking it. We too often eat overdone turkey or dry turkey at Thanksgiving. And then we say, oh no, I'd prefer to have prime rib or I'd prefer to have ham or I'd prefer to have salmon. No, it's Thanksgiving. Let's just accept that this is the paradigm and then make that turkey the best that we can. And we are here to help you do that. And and what was your um, newsletter today all about? Literally no idea. (laughs) <laughs> vegetarian I've, thanksgiving oh yes of course I've, i'm in the process i wrote a, a newsletter today so i'm off phase yeah, yeah. vegetarian thanksgiving yeah, yeah send a kid to college and then you'll discover about vegetarian thanksgiving um yeah we're um we're pretty thrilled about that like listen i'm still gonna make my turkey but you can have a fabulous vegetarian thanksgiving the, we have a recipe for a mushroom wellington that is just Aces. That's my go-to this year for Thanksgiving if you're going vegetarian. I, I, I want to talk about Thanksgiving in the sort of context of why does this sort of um, fake holiday, why should we still, still celebrate it? Um, oh, obviously great. our history is a little bit anyway why should we it's, still it's it's a fantastic question Lynn. why should we celebrate this holiday that recognizes or the, the myth of which seems to recognize the the perseverance of our pilgrim forefathers in the face of this incredibly difficult first year in a new land which we've stolen from others where the, the, the violated people uh, who are the indigenous um, um, residents uh, of this land we've stolen uh, help us through you know, our first harvest and offer deer and duck and, and, and corn and allow us to, to get through. Why would we ever do that? Like we're at a point where we recognize that the, the, the American experiment is one that was born um, in amid a kind of, amid virulent racism, amid um, uh, this kind of like literally white supremacist um, myth. Why, 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 why would we ever celebrate that now? And the answer is this, to me, this is an incredibly diverse country and the multiplicity of um, celebrations that we have that are related to our our religious uh, upbringing, where we came from originally, all this, where is the secular holiday that unites us all? Maybe the 4th of July? Nicole Hannah Jones has taught us like 1776 is maybe not the year that we ought to be looking at. So where can we look? And I say, let's look to to Thanksgiving. When I speak with, and we've done a lot of reporting on this, when I speak to immigrant families who have come to the United States, Thanksgiving is as 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 a kind of exercise in assimilation, as a non pariah like people just dig it. That first Thanksgiving in America is important. 
and seeing how families from around the world who have come to the United States, they came like, you know, my family, you know, via Scotland and, and Ireland and into Canada and into the United States, whether they came um, uh, as chattel or, or, or fled um, terrible things in other parts of the world, when they come to the United States, that first Thanksgiving is incredibly important. And then what happens? After a, an attempt to make this crazy American meal with its turkey and its mashed potatoes, the, the, the family changes it slightly. They still keep the turkey, but now we have Persian tadig instead of mashed potatoes. And that becomes a feast that becomes a, a tradition for that family, just as for another family, it's Cantonese style flavoring in, 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 in the turkey, but still a turkey. And what happens after that? There are children, those children marry off and all of a sudden you have the children of, of, of immigrants from the Ukraine married to children who are uh, children of immigrants from Sri Lanka and they both take their traditions and put, the, and this holiday begins to become what America promised us, which is the ability to all come together in a common understanding that we're gonna live in this democracy and we're gonna celebrate our traditions while also being American. And what does it mean to be American? We're fighting about that every day. We've never been more divided than we are today. But I think on this one day, we can come together as a nation under Turkey to understand that we're, everybody, most everybody, as the day off, most everybody is gathering yeah. with family and most everybody is, is gonna have this feast that has no God, that has no politics, that has only the promise of the American experiment at its, at its heart. And that's, that's, a, that's, I'm speaking free of politics entirely and only about this one moment when we can put everything aside and say like, yeah, Let's give thanks and let's give thanks to one another. Let's give thanks to the people we stole this land from. Let's give thanks to the people who've been oppressed. Let's give thanks to the people who lead our country. Let's give thanks to the people who have to work today and, um, and cut into this turkey because <laughs> we only cooked that turkey that one time. What, that one time. Okay, lightning round and then we're gonna open it up. Yep. So, so uh, Laura Peterson, the marvelous, started the lightning round during these wits and they're really pretty great. Um, and I have made my little set of questions. Um, Super nervous. You should be, yeah. Favorite kitchen tool? A uh, bench scraper. A uh, bench scraper is a, a kind of a, a square. It's, it's used in baking a lot to a scrape dough up dough. Scraper? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't use it for that, but I use it to pick up uh, diced vegetables and put them in a wok or put them in a pan to pick up diced meat and put it, I, I can move stuff around with it. It's like a magic eraser. Love a bench scraper. Best book you've read on food could be cookbook, memoir, writing on food. Um, I'm going to go, uh, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to go with Lori Colwin. I think Lori, you know, Lori Colin's books um, capture a kind of emotional resonance in the kitchen that I think is really important. She she was like, everything's going to be okay. I really believe everything's going to be okay. Uh -huh. um, and she, I remember reading, I think it's in Home Cooking. Um, she has a recipe for roast chicken that takes like two and a half hours, and and you think like, wouldn't that bird be cooked to? dryness but i followed the recipe and i was like wow she's so right i just want to be in her kitchen so very cool we, maybe we can maybe we can do that for you is there anything you won't eat like if it's served at someone's house you're like nope i'm not gonna eat that um no not really i had um there was a period of time when i believed that i was allergic to to mussels um, oh. I'd grown up uh, harvesting mussels on, at my grandmother's house in the coast of Maine. Um, and I think I got hit at some point with um, some red tide. And wow. I, I had a, and so that knocked me off mussels for, 
15 years or so. Um, but no, I, I once had a, um, a deep fried brain. I think it was like a half of cow brain in, in, a, in a Greek restaurant in St. Louis that was, that was really terrible. I like brain for the record, but the, the big hunk of deep fried brain with the veins and stuff, I'll pass on that going forward. Okay, yeah. What is the thing you've, you've cooked 10 times in the past year? Um, oh, well, pandemic has been really interesting. I, there's a recipe on New York Times cooking for bosom, or it's like a pork uh, shoulder that kind of cooks over about, you cure it for 12 hours and then cook it for 12 hours. And I've definitely, I, over, over pandemic, I made that easily once a month. Okay, you have no time restraints, no financial restraints, no carbon footprint restraints. Where would you go for a vacation and what would you eat there? Um, that's a great question. One of my colleagues, so the New York Times left our Hong Kong bureau because of press restrictions in Hong Kong and opened in Seoul in South Korea. Oh. And I, I've wanted, I, I'm going to, I'm going to figure out how to do this. I got to get to Seoul and I want to, I just want to spend a week eating in and around Seoul. There's just, I love Korean food. There's great Korean food in New York city, but um, money's no object. Carbon footprint's no object. I'm going to hang out in Seoul for a, a, a week to 10 days and, and figure that out. What book do you wish you wrote? Oh fuck! Like every the last book I I read every time. I'm just it, what book do I wish I wrote? That is a fearsomely good question. Um, I guess I wish I wrote Joseph Mitchell's Up in the Old Hotel. I would have loved to have been to have had that to have had a career like that. I don't want the writer's block he suffered at the end of his life, but. Oh. It, okay, it, it is time. Oh, <laughs> um, uh, it's time to open it up to questions. And um, Nikki is going to um, call on you if you raise your cartoon hand or your real hand. And if you're very shy, you could put it in the chat and she'll read it for you. But we'd love to see you. And um, yeah, so. Yes. Hit us. I will Hit see us. You if you raise your hand, but I do want to kick it off with a question that was already asked in the chat directly to me um, from Elizabeth Manis, who is a, was a fan of yours from when you were at the New York Press. She wants to ask what you had learned about food and cooking and the New York City food scene while you were there. So working for New York Press was um, was a was a real privilege. There was no the internet. There was no internet really. I mean, we had an internet and I, I eventually could file via modem uh, over my landline, but there wasn't, there weren't blogs even. And to have a weekly newspaper with this tiny little footprint, we had a hundred thousand subscribers. They were all downtown and we could, we kind of could do whatever we wanted. And the freedom to be able to subvert the newspaper form and, 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 and write kind of personally and sometimes lacerating prose um, was really fun. And I learned a lot about, um, I guess, subverting the rules when I was at New York Press. Like there's that, there's that Bob Dylan line about to live outside the law, you must be honest. And I felt that was what we were doing at New York Press. We were, we were real journalists writing real newspaper articles but they were puckish and 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 funny and and wry, and I loved the freedom of being able to do that. And about half the time, we were writing anonymously, or or we were not. We were writing in an institutional voice, and I loved figuring out what that institutional voice was and and being able to use it. Loved working there. Hey, thanks so much, and thanks, Elizabeth. Um, Glenda has written in the chat, uh, do you still keep old cookbooks annotated with yours or others notes or is your kitchen all digital? No, no, I have tons and tons of, of cookbooks. Um, I have a huge cookbook 
collection and, and it's it's really important to me. Um, I don't cook from cookbooks so much any longer um, simply because the, the ones that have made the cut that I keep, um, I now know them and I look at them for, for inspiration. But I know, you know, I, I believe if you cook a recipe four or five times, it's your recipe. And you might get, you might go and just check like, what's that? But I'm going to play the song the way I, I play the song. But I love having it there as, as memory. I don't take notes in, in, in my cookbooks. Um, I keep things in my cookbooks, menus, um, mostly menus, I guess, um, or, or, or printouts of recipes that I've looked at over, over, over the years. But and I'm sorry for this because I'd, I'd love to be able to pass along to my kids notebooks that say like less salt, fry harder, but I don't do that. Good, thanks, Glenda. Uh, Terry has the next question. Um, can you recommend a Korean grocery store in Manhattan for the best kimchi? Oh, great question. Um, so uh, a Korean mom would tell you mine is the best kimchi, um, but I don't have a Korean mom. So I go to H Mart. Um, which is an amazing chain of Korean owned grocery stores uh, that are now in, in there are t I think two in Manhattan, one on 32nd street in, in Koreatown and one on 110th and Broadway near uh, Columbia. And H Mart has some quality, quality kimchi um, in its aisles as does the chain Food Bazaar, which um, is, I know there's, there's one right here in my neighborhood in Red Hook and a few other places around Manhattan. Good kimchi at both. Thank you and thanks, Terry. Um, I have a question from Win Two. I just want to remind everybody, if you would like to add Sam directly, please don't be shy, raise your hand. Um, I promise oh. somehow looking at everybody at once. But, but when next, and please ignore my cat who apparently also had the question. Um, yeah. when, like, you know, would you mind talking about the next generation of Sifton cooks? How do your kids? <laughs> That's a, thank you for that question. It's, it's gotta be kind of weird, I think, to be, to be my kid. Um, just because I, when they were little, I was gone at dinner all the time. Um, I was out. My wife was not interested in going to my job every day at night to go to, to, to restaurants. She's like, that's your job. Go to, I don't, you don't come to my work. I'm not going to your work. So I would be out every night and, they, and, and my wife was cooking with, with the kids when they were little. But, but my promise was everybody will always have a hot breakfast together. So I'd be there sometimes in sunglasses, palming Advil's at seven o'clock in the morning to feed them a hot breakfast before they went to school. But I wasn't around for dinner until I was. And then I'm cooking every night and testing recipes every night. So they go for, it, it just, it must've been super odd for them. But what's been amazing to see is how they've developed as cooks in their own right. My older one is a student at College of the Atlantic where Lynn used to work. And, um, and has lived off campus since their freshman or since their sophomore year and cooks all the time. This was my most picky eater as a kid, um, but has, has figured out how to do it on their own and, and, is, um, and is actually a really good cook. The little one who's just off to college now uh, was a baker where I was, um, I'm, I'm, I'm an okay pastry cook, but my kid is a great pastry cook. And it's really interesting to see how that's playing out. So that they say, the younger one said to me, can, is there any way like, you know that little instant pot we have? Can I have that for my dorm room? And then called me the other night to, to explain that she'd made chicken congee on her own in her dorm room for her and her friends. And I was like, oh, that's, that's really cool, 18-year-old spawn. So they're coming up good. They're going to be good cooks. I think I made cupcakes once in college. So that's uh, pretty impressive. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Michael Stelic here. Um, he said it was a great apple pie recipe in the paper the other day and excellent feedback from readers for tweaking it. 
He, however, needs a great pie crust recipe and techniques for making it great. Will we see one soon in the Times? Well, Michael, I think we've already got one in there. Um, um, and we've got more to come from Melissa Clark, who's our, who's our greatest, I think, our greatest baker right now. Um, you can look at, I've got a okay all-purpose pie dough recipe on New York Times cooking that I, I would recommend to, to most people, but not to Michael Selleck. To Michael Selleck, I say, wait for um, Melissa Clark to drop her, her pie crust recipe, and there's going to be a video attached uh, that you'll find on, on our YouTube channel. Like and subscribe, you guys. Um, I think she's going to make our pie experience this Thanksgiving just great. Sam, I'm going to ask you one. Um, how do you deal? You have 29 people coming for Thanksgiving. I'm lactose intolerant. Um, I have gluten allergy. I'm carb free. I'm on Whole30. Um, I'm allergic to, you know, ev everything. Like, how, how do you deal with yeah, those people? I, I smile. I try. I'm I want us to have an inclusive table. I think there should be something on the on the groaning board for everyone. Um, I don't. I'm not aggressive about this. You don't have to have the turkey, but I'm definitely making the turkey. You don't have to have uh, the, the the mashed potatoes if you don't eat butter. Um, I'll there'll be something there for you. But I'm not a short order cook, and neither are you. And at a certain point, like. If you can't go out, you can't go out. Like I, I, I will make sure there is something on the table that is nutritious, that is has protein in it that will leave you sated and in, and and enjoying your meal. But we're not going to create a situation where I'm short order cooking. Like I'm a pharmacist saying like this is this is what is prescribed to you and you and you and you and you. Um, the point is to gather around the table and to be inclusive and the, and the, and the menu will be inclusive. Um, but you don't get to be special just because you don't eat gluten or you don't eat meat. Like there will be something for you, but we're not going to make a big deal out of it. I, I have to say one of the amazing things about the app is that you can just put those things in though and up pops gluten-free Thanksgiving recipes and yep. it, there's just so much there. How, how many recipes are now on that? Oh, I think we're, we're, we're probably up to 22,000 recipes going back to 1982 or so. And you know the, the bulk of the growth that we've had in the last few years has been in the very areas that people are looking for, like the, the interest in, in vegetarian food, vegan food and, and gluten-free food has just gone up and up and up. And, and, and we hope that we're there to, to meet them. My old favorite go-to vegetarian main course for Thanksgiving was a recipe that's still on the site that's called Really Big Beets. <laughs> And I love, <laughs> I love the idea of serving a really big beat. Um, but of course, there's no protein. There. Like, that's not what people want. So we've, yeah. we, we've moved in a direction where we're offering what I, people want, where they want it. And I love how you tried to not print plum tart in September, and you nearly lost your job. Yeah, yeah. People <laughs> go crazy. They want that plum tart from Marion Burroughs. They've wanted it since 1982. It's amazing. Yeah. I've made it 10 times this fall. Always with plums or with tons of, or with different fruits? Different. Yes. Beautiful. But lots of with plums. One peach, an apple, you know, the whole thing. Super adaptable. Yes. Right. We have one final follow-up question from Michael Selleck asking traditional dressing or cornmeal? Well, so... This is, this is one of the things that I love about Thanksgiving is this question of what is traditional? Traditional to whom? To you? To someone else? Um, is traditional the, what we see in the uh, 
Norman Rockwell painting Freedom from Want is traditional what we understand to from our childhood in Pasadena or Anchorage or Blue Hill or, or the Florida Panhandle. It's different for from everyone. Um, so, but I'm assuming if we're looking at traditional dressing or cornmeal or cornbread, it's like, it, I want them both. I usually do a, a, a cornbread dressing um, with lots of peppers and sausage. But I also like like uh, take a like a like some of the last of the sourdough and and make a more New England version um, that'll be like sourdough, celery, clams, chiriqua, or which is the Portuguese uh, version of chorizo that's common in, in in New England. So I I gotta tell you, and I love that you called it dressing, not stuffing, because there's if I can leave you with one last thing, please don't stuff your bird make the dressing on the side and ladle some stock on to the end for that, that, so you have more and maybe even make more dressing. So answer that question, traditional or corn? Both. <laughs> I have spoken. <laughs> Sam, thank you so much. It's always so fun to talk with you. And like um, yeah, so I owe you still yet again. And um, for just uh, to wrap up, we our next talk is, um, Jane Shapiro, who is a Shakespeare scholar and a professor at Columbia um, in 2020, one of the New York Times uh, notable books of the year was his Shakespeare in a Divided America. He will be speaking with our friend, Ted Widmer, who um, is a Lincoln scholar and Lincoln was a huge Shakespeare fan. So we're good. We have a Shakespeare and Lincoln um, talk. That's Monday, December 6th. Then we're going to talk about wine with Andre Houston Mack and Jay McInerney on Monday, December 13th. That's at five. These are normally at seven, but Jay said, no, we should talk during cocktail hour or after teeth hour, as he says. Um, Ralph Eubanks and Roxana Robinson will be talking about Southern writers and Southern books um, first thing in January. And then Ronan Farrow and Gia Tolentino will be talking about the lives of women in February, and we have many more to come. So thanks, everybody, for joining us. Sam, thanks again. I hope to see you soon here in Maine. Thank you, Lynn. See you soon.